All right, guys, get close to end game. This is a reminder for me. Thank you for that reminder. So one of the things, as I mentioned just briefly, when I was a third year resident here at CU, it was a nice uh, exchange that we had with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. A woman called Mary Hamill had gone to do that program some years before I came. She's a malaria specialist now at NIH and uh, or CDC, excuse me. And so she had set up this culture of goodwill. That people from Colorado could spend three months in London learning about tropical medicine. I didn't know anything about London or tropical medicine, but it sounded cool, and I decided to go. It was certainly transformative for me. It was fun, and there were just no patients because it was in London. <laughs> so now, fast forward 10 years later, several friends of mine at UW and Johns Hopkins and the London School, we all agreed together, look, we really need to make a course in Africa. This is crazy. Why don't we have one of those? And then we did it, and we realized that's, we found out all the reasons why there's not one of those, because it's freaking impossible, <laughs> but we've done it, and it's uh, a great success and a lot of fun. This course is running, we're just now completing the third year. It's every fall. Uh, six weeks in Moshi, Tanzania. So you work at a hospital called KCMC, which is a regional district hospital uh, that serves a community of maybe a quarter of a million. And then six weeks in uh, Uganda, in Kampala, at Malago Hospital, which is the biggest hospital in Uganda. Totally different, major urban African experience. And it's the same didactics, similar didactics to the London course, but much more time on the wards seeing patients, not only in hospital, but there were, there were two one-week-long rural placements where you spend a week in rural Tanzania or rural Uganda, learning about public health challenges, etc. It's really built for people who want to do clinical work um, in Africa, uh, and the goal is to pair up uh, African docs and northern docs. So it's about, right now, one-third African docs two-thirds northern. We're really shooting for 50-50, but the finances haven't quite worked out yet. So we're getting close to that. This year we have physicians from Rwanda, South Sudan, Kenya, Tanzania, uh, Botswana. Uh, it's very, very exciting and it's been a lot of fun for these participants and the friends they make they keep for a lifetime. I know this is true from when I was on the London course. Anyway, I'm excited about that class and I don't get paid to teach on it even though I'm one of the co-founders, so there's no financial conflict. But I do have up here, and I'll leave for you guys, uh, some brochures. The most important thing of the whole brochure is on the front page, which is the web link to how to sign up for the class. And uh, in fact, there's another website we've built called tropmedafrica.org, which is easy to find as well. And I'll leave this here in case any of you are so interested. I wish I had better scholarship support for you. It's about 10,000 US bucks. And at the moment, I don't have any scholarships to back up US participants, which is an issue, uh, and we're trying to fix it. But if you have 10,000 in three months to burn, you may way to do it. So I'll leave this here. God, if I can put it up here. Okay, so we're making a change. So what have we done today? Protozoa. We just did some helmets. Let's do some bacteria. Why not? I thought you guys would be bored now, so I wanted to start with a case. I'm not bored. I figured you'd be bored. So this is a case we saw at my hospital uh, about three years ago. 26-year-old gentleman, myalgias, shortness of breath. He has pain in his legs, headache, and fever, all lasting about a week. He's seen in primary care. He's found to have this new elevation of serum creatinine, high CPK, crit is normal, platelet counts slightly low. And so he, he was told he had the flu and sent home with ibuprofen or something like this. He comes back to the emergency department feeling more short of breath, feeling more achy. Now his creatinine is definitely not better. His creatinine is starting to fall and the platelets have come down as well. Talking to him, what's going on at home? Anybody else with the flu? Well, actually, yeah, my wife and child both have respiratory symptoms too, uh, but nothing else in terms of sick contacts that I know of. He's not eating well. So he's admitted to the hospital. Thank God, it's not our hospital, outside hospital. He's put to the hospital, and it's found that he has hypoxemia. In fact, he gets two on the second day. Out of the endotracheal tube comes gross blood. He's hypotensive, he's septic, he's placed on pressors. He's given methylpred and cyclophosphamide. The theory is that he has anti-glomerular basement membrane disease. He has good pasture syndrome. And I just, so I don't know a lot about tropical medicine. In tropical medicine, it's not good pasture syndrome, okay? It's just not going to be good pasture syndrome. It's going to be anything else 
not good enough for them. This happens in my system. Like we have the most wonderful intro to medicine house staff. They're thinking about everything. They hear hoofbeats. They think zebras. They should have thought about a bigger zebra than this. That's all I'm saying. Anyway, they put them on continuous veno venous hemodialysis. They fereced him. They maxed out his support. And then they started to get a history from his wife, etc. There was no past medical history. He was on a little bit of ibuprofen for his flu. Uh, there was no history of good pasture syndrome or lupus or anything else in the family. Social history. Now, he lived in Washington. He was not put into that box of tropical medicine or even ID. He was a waste collector who lived uh, nearby Seattle. Smoked a little bit, drank a little bit, didn't shoot, etc. On uh, physical exam, you can see here, and the bottom line is that these are the vital signs all in vasopressin that they were gradually starting to titrate down at this point. As you can see, he's on 100% fraction of inhaled oxygen at that time. And he was yellow. This dude was yellow. You could read by the light of the yellow coming off of his skin, he was acutely yellow. And um, aside from that, and the scleral interest and some coarse breath sounds throughout, there was nothing else in particular on his physical exam. The rest of his exam was okay, except his neurologic exam, but he was sedated, so this wasn't felt to be focal. So here are some of his labs from early on in his stay. And I won't call them out to you. That Billy Rubin, by any unit system, <laughs> that ain't right. Okay. Even in adults, guys, know what you know Billy like that. So here's his blood gas. And the bottom line is that he did have some so-called active urinary sediment. So he was felt probably to have good pasture disease or some sort of vasculitis, if you will. That's not right. Bilateral reticular nodular sort of fluffy appearing infiltrates on his chest film. So he was given what I'm having in my hospital. I know you guys don't do this. In my hospital, they all get Vank and Zosin, right? So this is what they do. Actually, in this case, they had actually gone to Septrax. Because they were convinced it probably wasn't pseudomonas. So I think they were talked down off the ledge. They went to Septrax. <laughs> and was given azithromycin. And the doxycycline was actually added uh, two days later when ID was involved, actually. It wasn't initially there. It was just Vank, Septrax, and an AZ for community-acquired pneumonia. And then got some methylprednisolone. As a Hail Mary for this uh, idea of good pasture disease, etc. Does he have an autoimmune pulmonary hemorrhage? And, you know, ID was consulted, history was elicited. What was the magic word for this case? Every board question has a magic word, right? You see it and then you've got the answer. Yellow skin? The yellow skin is good, uh, but it's not magic. Waste collector. Waste collector. Waste collector. Sanitary engineer. He's a garbage man. So when you hear garbage man, you need to think of this particular condition. Yellow skin and garbage man is this disease. And so our ID, but the poor medicine house, they didn't know if they've ever seen this before. It is rare in Washington State, even though it's globally it's the most common zoonosis. So ID was consulted, they thought about this, and you know, at this point there was actually negative serologies um, for everything except for leptospirosis. So the acute, it's interesting, this acute number of 1 to 50, that's not screaming high. Um, but the ID attending wasn't me. He said, you know, I think this might actually be the acute. I want to get a paired convalescent syrup. I still think this is fulminant, aggressive pulmonary form of leptospirosis. Don't stop the doxycycline or the steroids. And ultimately, he did well. He was continued on doxy, he was continued on methylprednisolone. Everything else was tapered off. All of his other studies were clean as a whistle. And he survived, was extubated, and did fine. Uh, absolutely did fine. The paired zero was 1 to 12,800. I didn't know they could go that high. But evidently, I could, who's the poor lab tech who's making those kind of trains? <laughs> for a kind of strain injury in the short So, uh, yeah, he has leptospirosis, right? So, this is a, a classic case of lepto, which didn't come out of the tropics. It came out of our cold, damp, gray Washington state. And the point is, lepto is everywhere, so please think about it. We're going to talk about two different bacterial pathogens. The first is leptospirosis. The goal is to get you up to speed on lepto. All these slides are available to you. If I raise your consciousness around this, you will start to make this diagnosis more and more often. It's interesting. So, it's a zoonosis. What is a zoonosis? I forget. You catch it at the zoo. You mean? An infection shares between human and other vertebrate hosts. If it goes through a mosquito, that doesn't count. That's an invertebrate. Human and other vertebrate hosts. Yeah, leptospirosis. So, in general, zoonoses are these infections. And the problem with zoonoses, they're totally interesting. Um, but there's anything can be zoonotic. 
We've already talked about several of them today. Parasitic, uh, for example, bacterial, fungal zoonoses. There's a ton of viral zoonoses. In fact, you have, in this course, you have lectures coming up on viral hemorrhagic fevers. Many of these are zoonotic as well. And the problem, even prions, the humble protein, that's a zoonosis. So the problem here is that um, they can go to any organ system, can be any class of pathogen. There's absolutely not any shared single piece except for the exposure to animals. Again, in peas and in medicine generally, it all comes down to that history. Ask about the animal exposures. In this case, the guy didn't even have a pet at home. Didn't even have a dog. He had to talk to me, but he didn't have a dog. <laughs> but of course, it was that waste collection, because what he was doing was inadvertently bathing himself daily in the urine of rats, dogs, and cats, and he just didn't realize it. So it's all about that history. Lab work will rarely give you the answer that will define a zoonosis. You have to think about it and send a specialized test to confirm what you're thinking about with respect to your zoonosis. So the history of lepto, kind of interesting as well, what happened was that Weil, I think it's somehow German, I think it was Professor Herr, Professor Weil, described four cases of scleral interest in renal failure. So this was called Weil's disease, and in fact there are still tests that are sometimes run called Weil's test. That's all you needed back in the 1800s was four cases and you got a disease named after you. Today it's like, you can't even publish a case series if it's less than 400. It's a different time. Well, it's interesting is that the disease goes by all these other names. That's my favorite, mud fever. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> the point is, it has these many names because it presents uh, all over the world, over time, time and again. And it usually has to do with humans, animals, and water, or aqueous environments. So actually, in 1907, Stimson really started to figure out what was going on. He had a patient who had died of yellow fever, because he had fever, and he was yellow. Must have been yellow fever. Did the autopsy, and in fact, it wasn't yellow fever. Okay, what he actually found was that this patient's kidneys were packed on silver stain with this totally bizarre corkscrew-shaped bacteria, which he had not seen before. He knew it was a spirochete, and it had the shape of a question mark. So we actually called it spirochete enterogen. It kind of looks like a question mark, doesn't it? And for whatever reason, that's the shape of the human form of this pathogen. Subsequently, Noguchi and Stokes worked on this during World War I. In World War I, there was a tremendous issue on both sides of the lines with respect to leptospirosis. Um, both of them figured this out uh, at the same time, in Jap Japan and in Germany. They both inoculated themselves and they both died this way, thereby simultaneously confirming what, uh, what was happening here. There's an interesting story, a book uh, called Who Goes First? by Dr. Altman from New York Times, talking about the history of self-experimentation in medicine. And uh, if you're interested in this, if you want to know why you have to fill out those IRB forms, this is why. It's an interesting one. So this is leptospirosis. What is the impact on planet Earth? The most prevalent and highest incidence zoonosis on our planet, leptospirosis. It's every place. Every place you don't want to be. So leptospirosis, it's totally interesting. It looks like Here's a, I love this case series. Doctors in Iquitos were dealing with patients presenting to casualty with fever. What could the fever be? Well, everyone assumed it was malaria. But these doctors were doing malarial films. They weren't seeing malaria. And it's Iquitos. There's not a lot of malaria at that elevation. What do these people have? So they started looking intentionally for leptospirosis. The numbers speak for themselves. Half of these patients had lepto. And these, that's 50% of patients who had fever in an emergency room who otherwise would have had no specific treatment, would have had no specific diagnosis. And then we, we would say you had an influenza-like illness. So the point is, I think all of us, domestically and overseas as well, we're seeing leptospirosis, whether or not we realize that we are. It's there. It's usually fine. Most people are OK. But once in a while, we get it wrong, the patient will suffer like this gentleman did. In this particular case, in, in our country, Hawaii is certainly the epicenter for it. They're so sick of it in Hawaii, they don't even ask to hear about it anymore. It's not a publicly health reportable disease any longer. Fascinating. Here's a map of Micronesia. These are veterinarians who've gone through the island chains, taking out the urine of dogs. How you catch that urine, I don't know. <laughs> they must catch the dogs and put them in a cage and feed them water until they pee in a dish. I don't know. When they did this study, it was fascinating because they looked for the prevalence of leptospirosis in the urine of these dogs. And basically, dark red here in the Solomons, 40 to 70 percent of these dogs were positive. Substantial numbers of dogs just running around the islands, 
full of leptospirosis. I just love dogs. So, <laughs> in, in all sincerity and all fairness to our furry friends, this is uh, an infection that's happy to go to virtually any mammal. Okay, anything that's furry, like we are, and has a warm heartbeat, it'll go into. So it seems to be really uh, happy to be in rats, but also dogs, pigs, and cows. And for whatever reason, it loves the kidneys. So it will inhabit the tubules, go into the renal parenchyma, colonize that area, reproduce, and get shed into the urine. It's perfect. Right? It's body temperature. There's just enough glucose or water or salt milieu is just right. And I have friends who grow this stuff in the lab, and it's basically cow pee that they grow it in. It's like the perfect medium for it. And it is also getting shed into the environment constantly, which helps to perpetuate its spread throughout populations. And so how do you catch it? You don't have to drink it. You don't have to have an actual obvious abrasion. Uh, the numbers that are coming out of these unbelievable, uh, the, the great race, the adventures of Borneo, triathlons in Micronesia, huge numbers. In some cases, 40% of people doing the triathlon in Borneo come out with leptospirosis. Now, there was a, there was a swimming port in that, right? So they were probably drinking in all this rat pee as they were swimming along these rivers and stuff. So you, you don't have to actually intentionally ingest it. There are people who just splash through. Uh, puddles of rain, which is dilute urine, that's what rain is, right? Puddles of rain on the ground, and they'll end up getting infected as well. But it's a fascinating disease because it's not like the worms we talked about before where there's one or two flavors. Many, many serovars, many subspecies of this bacteria. Some of these subspecies have a real predilection just for the kidney. Others love to go to the lungs uh, or to the blood vessels, etc. So there's different virulence factors and left to the weak absolutely, totally do not yet understand. So here's a cow's kidney, which is just absolutely packed with this sort of fibrinopurulent inflammatory collecting duct. And if you zoom in on this, you'd see nothing but leptospires. And I just think it's such an interesting story because there's other corkscrew bacteria that are out there that we already know a lot about, like syphilis, right? So this is a cousin of T. pallidum, the agent of syphilis. And in T. pallidum, they don't look exactly alike, but they're similar, right? And in syphilis, you know, we think that there's about a thousand open breeding frames. There's probably about a thousand genes in syphilis. And it's a complicated, crazy disease. It's not simple. It has that weird second outer membrane. I don't even understand what happens in syphilis, why it has those three phases, all of that. But that is nothing compared to leptospirosis, right? We don't even, probably three or four times, maybe even five times the number of genes in lepto. We don't know what these things are there. Homology scores, if you just blast them on a search engine, is very, very low. Well. A lot of unique, novel genes in lepto that we simply don't have another good basis for understanding what they may do. The point is, a lot of mysteries in this question mark shaped bacteria that's there. In animals, the species that seems to be the best for them is called Leptospirosis biflexus. It has those two flexion points in animals or humans, interrogants. So, both animals and humans can get in trouble with interrogants. That's the issue. Humans don't get into trouble with biflexa. And by definition, it's this left-handed or lepto, left, left-handed spire, and leptospira interrogants uh, shape. It's an aerobic bug, and the truth is you can grow it. It takes about a week, and as I mentioned, one of my friends from Monash, um, Paul Cullen, I used to share a lab bench with this guy. And once in a while, I'd reach for a pipette or something, open a drawer, and there'd be these stacks of dishes, liquid medium. I was like, what is that? He said, oh, that's this highly pathogenic pulmonary strain of leptospirosis. I was like, you know, I've just reached into that drawer. What are you doing? He's like, it's okay. If you get sick, just take some doxycycline. <laughs> I said, this is the difference between the PhD and the MD. Like, can you please move that stuff out of here? But the point is, he would keep it at room temperature in the dark without feeding it or watering it or singing it bedtime songs. He'd just put it into the drawer. It would stay for months. This stuff is incredibly hardy, very, very durable. And uh, unfortunately, this makes it hard to control, right? So the exposures, the classic exposures for your board exams, yep, garbage collectors right at the top of the list. Definitely true for rafting or exposure to white water in the tropics. Uh, household exposures are there. Rats in particular. Rats just love to get infected. They're splashing around in urine all the time. They're eating garbage. They're shedding it back into that same environment. So when we hear about garbage collectors, we're thinking about rat urine in particular. They're also at risk for rat bite fever, which is a separate story. So. It's just a shame that this still happens, right? And though there are epidemics of leptospirosis the world around, but especially in areas of poor sanitation. If you go to the Indian subcontinent, 
you deal with populations where there's not a good sewage system, right, at any time, even during drought, that's a big enough problem. But then come the monsoons, then comes a typhoon, then comes rainfall, and everything backs up. And all of a sudden, the streets have turned into rivers, rivers of animal urine. And so, you know, this still absolutely happens. The truth is, as we've said, you can be in this country, you can be all pure and proper about your health and be a triathlete and still get into real trouble. Or where I live in Washington State, this is classic, a poor sea lion washes up on the beach or a dolphin. And you know what do kids do? I have kids. They go and they try to pet and poke the little hole and stuff like that. It's just a magic idea. You know, it's like this thing. Is just, why do you think it died? It's full of leptospirosis. <laughs> you know, I just, this is how I want you to think. When your patient is bathed in animal dirt, Pick up laptop. And for God's sakes, give them some Purell or something when you're done. Touch them. <laughs> so, having said so, how does this present clinically? Yeah, there's an incubation period. For some people, it's a couple days. The average is probably a week or so. This is true for a lot of influenza like illnesses, right? No difference with lepto. And these patients show up with the flu. The ER that initially saw in the primary care doc was right. It's usually flu. That's exactly what this patient seemed to have. In particular, the myalgias. And I don't know why that is. But I think of that myself with influenza A infection. It's certainly true with lepto as well. Now, most people will get over this. There'll be a spontaneous recovery, and they'll do totally fine. They have immune response. It is, after all, a bacteria. They make antibodies. Their serology converts. 1 to 12,000 and 800. Like, they've got a good, healthy response. It's only a small number of people who end up getting really, truly sick. And the illness, for example, what I showed you, uh, it can go many ways, but that's, that's certainly a perfectly fine way to see this show up. Classic is, in fact, the icterus, the jaundice, uh, that's there. But as this patient demonstrated, there's a big pulmonary predilection for some of these strains, too. I mean, he basically had ARDS, right? Mm -hmm. and why did he have that? Why was that capillary leak there? They stuck a tube in and out came blood. They were right. He had pulmonary hemorrhage syndrome. It just happened to be because of leptospirosis, and we don't understand why this happens in some patients and not in others. The other classic thing to see is CK elevation. So, and I don't know if that's because they're just rigoring themselves into their CK, tearing down their muscles, or what drives that, but I haven't seen it cause rhabdo, but you will classically see high CKs in these patients. Now, in the textbooks, you'll read that this is a biphasic illness. Fever, convalescence, fever again, and then full recovery. And that's like everything else in the textbooks. Because it's classic, it is rare, right? And it's disproportionately represented on board exams. The truth is, if you actually look at this in large series, fewer than half of patients will have that classical presentation. But because it's in the books, and because you may actually see it, this is how it's supposed to go. If the germs read our textbooks, this is what they would do. They'd have a septicemic phase, and then uh, an immune or convalescent phase. And that septicemic phase, uh, it is felt to be one of the things, like typhoid, where you have a relative disconnect between the fever and the heart rate, high temperature, without a tachycardia. Think about lepto. Rare, but when you see it, it should be on your list of things. And these patients will take about a week to get better, and then uh, will come their recurrence. And that recurrence may happen three, four, maybe even five days later, that they get sick one more time. It, and this is more fever, more rigors, a high CK, et cetera. And that convalescence will take a long time. These people feel like they're hit by a freight train. It's like they're post-mononucleosis, chronic fatigue type of patient. Do you treat these people? Because I sure do. I'm tired of it. It drives me crazy. But the bottom line is they just need to get better. What's happening here isn't clear. I don't know why that biphasic piece happens. My sense is that the body is trying to figure out how to mount an effective humoral response. The B cells finally catch up, and they make an enormous number of specific antibodies, and also driving up cytokine production. And this is basically cytokines gone wild. Is that what they would call it on YouTube? Cytokines gone wild. So these people actually take a longer time to just let things totally simmer down. They probably should be treated with prednisone, frankly. I haven't had the guts to do that, but it probably makes sense to actually tamp things down once the germs are killed and dead and gone. So the complications are the ones I've shown you here already, right? ARDS, hepatitis renal failure, rhabdo, myocarditis, hemorrhage, meaning in particular pulmonary hemorrhage. They can also have a thrombocytopenia, and spontaneous hemorrhage can happen too. Some will have a Guillain-Barre, an ADM, even a transverse myelitis. Neurologic sequelae from leptospirosis is reported. I have not seen this. And some patients don't survive. They will die. Here's a case given to me by Raul Stewart's from Caracas. Lovely guy. Here's a patient he saw in his hospital. 
Um, Beju comes in from the Pampas. He's a cattle, cattleman from the Pampas uh, in Venezuela, and he has fever, jaundice, and purpura. And so he looked for all the world like yellow fever. I'm thinking back to those original days with Stimson, all those centuries ago or whatever it was. He had the same experience. He was at the bedside teaching the house staff, and they said, look, this is going to be a case of yellow fever. We want to do this and that with the patient. Um, and he said, well, when you give antibiotics, they said, no, no, it's a viral infection. And so what did he say? He said, look up, examine the patient. They looked, they said, yeah, he has yellow sclera. He said, no, have the patient look up. And this is what they saw. So these subconjunctival suffusions bleeding into the sclera, bulbar conjunctiva, and the sclera was there. And that's totally, it's not totally pathognomonic, but it's highly suggestive of leptospirosis in particular. Dengue fever can do this too, that's on the list, but not with that scleral entrance. So conjunctival suffusion and hemorrhages without true conjunctivitis, think about the dysphyrosis. That was his teaching to me. Um, the differential is as broad as the broad blue ocean. And again, these folks come in with fever, they have an influenza-like illness. Do we ever really truly know what they've got? Unless you send those serologies or do specialized testing, stain their urine, do a stain of the blood, to a blood culture, you won't actually figure out exactly what they've got. The reality is that a lot of these things will get better by themselves. They don't all require treatment with doxycycline, and some of them you're going to get doxycycline for anyway. I think that's part of the confounding process with respect to our understanding of the epidemiology. In the tropics, it's never good pastures. <laughs> so how would we make a diagnosis? You know, the dark field microscope is such a great way to go. That's how you would, let's say you had a chancre of primary syphilis, you'd scrape that chancre, that genital ulcer, and you look at it under a dark field microscopy, right? Most hospitals don't have a dark field microscope. Ours doesn't. Um, we do in the lab, uh, the lab where I used to work. But that's only for research purposes. It's a lost art, and it's a tragedy because it's such an easy, quick thing to do. But it takes a little training, a little bit of maintenance of skills, and so it atrophies and dies. It's a shame. So unfortunately, we don't often do this. Um, and by the way, you're handling live bugs, and so it potentially is hazardous to staff. So the culture is definitely gold standard, but it takes time. And by the time the culture comes back, the patient's either dead or cured. And so that's not so great either. Serology is how this is typical. So paired sera and acute and convalescent. And if you have a significant increase, or if at any point, you have tighter greater than 1 to 800, yeah, you're looking at leptospirosis. It's one of my pearls for you guys. Um, please consider that. If you're working someone up for FUO, right from the get-go, when you're first seeing them, just take a red top and just put it on ice, please. Because sure enough, some pointy-headed ID person like us is going to come along a couple weeks later. We're going to say, oh, do you have the acute sera? We want to send it for, you know, for leptospirosis or something like this. And you'll wish you had that. In my lab, um, the hold bloods for a month. That's part of their standard. You say spin and hold. And so the, after a month, they'll chuck it. They figure by then the patient's dead or you don't carry it. You can always keep a red top tube on ice uh, for a month. That can be helpful. And I would also emphasize, you get a positive test, it's not necessarily indicative of leptospirosis. It's a corkscrew shaped bacteria. And so it definitely cross reacts with other things, even Legionella, which is a little creepy because that's not exactly the same family, but it does. Lyme disease, relapsing fever, syphilis for obvious reasons. They're very closely related. And then there's PCR. Right? There's always a molecular test for that. And uh, it's simply not available in the tropics. Um, and at our hospital, it's something that we rarely send. We still rely on the serology, at least in the W. How do we treat these patients? But everyone agrees you'll hear all these controversies. I'm going to take all the controversies. It's actually pretty simple. Give them meticulous supportive care. If you have intensive care, put them there. Uh, if these patients have been sick enough to come to you and be admitted to the hospital, I worry about those complications of ARDS, etc. So the highest level of care you've got, at least for the first day or so, simply to observe and try to get them some kind of family uh, Observation, if there's a nurse who works at your hospital, have the nurse observe them. Make sure that they don't turn south. This gentleman did so quickly. That part's easy. The, the harder part is, do you give me antibiotics? The reason this is a hard thing for those lovely colleagues at the Cochrane Collaboration, the reason they can't figure this out is because there's so much heterogeneity, so much variability. Some patients, in fact most, do totally fine. Most of these patients don't need treatment. Most of these patients have a healthy immune system. Most of them will be okay. And some will totally not be okay. And I can't figure out who that is. It's not their HIV status. 
It's something to do with their host immune makeup and that particular serotype. And so, and so I just think it's frustrating to me that we have to talk about this. Until the last couple of months, doxy was so cheap and available, I would say give it to everybody. Frankly, if I can't get doxy, I give them minocycline. If a patient comes to see me and they're sick enough to get through my waiting list, to come to my clinic, and I'm hard to get to, yeah, I'll give them some doxy something. It's okay. That's true for me on an individual patient basis. From a public health perspective, what do you do as a health officer for a hospital or a district? It's tougher to say. If you have a precious resource of doxycycline, would you spend it here, or would you give that to someone who's a kid who has malaria or something like that? Then the question is tougher. But in the USA, generally speaking, the standard is that we give these patients doxycycline. The trick is if you give them doxy, what's the first thing from Hippocrates? Don't hurt the patient, right? No first, no harm, right? right? So again, you can make these folks hurts. That happens. It really happens if you give them a beta-lactin. These corpse crew shaped bacteria, like syphilis, man, they are so, so exquisitely susceptible and sensitive to beta-lactin antibiotics. So I would really try to avoid amoxicillin, ceftriaxone, and folks like this. By the way, this patient did get ceftriaxone right out of the gate. I don't know it, but I think that some of his initial cardiovascular collapse was because he probably hurts with somebody out of good intentions gave him ceftriaxone. Anyway, in general, I would say if it's mild disease, give him a week of doxycycline, pretend he has Lyme disease, treat him that way. I like doxy over uh, amox because you get less herx. And if the patient has rickettsial infection, it's good. The old saying where I trained, oh yeah, it was this hospital in Colorado. Nobody dies without a trial of doxycycline and steroids. And I think that's still probably true. Or number two, if it's severe disease, yeah, again, the same thing, just make it IV doxy and double the duration. Antibiotics, a small part of the management of patients with multiple sclerosis. Critical care and meticulous care, certainly important. And then there's other stuff you can do if they're truly allergic to both of these drugs. It's not a very drug resistant strain, it's just more pathological and requires supportive care. That's how I would summarize that. You know, since the world was common zoonosis, it is a spirochete. It is protean. Remember, Proteus was the god who would change from a horse to a dove to a sea urchin or whatever. That's the same idea here. It can change in many ways. It looks like influenza, and it can be tough to diagnose for that, for that reason. So make your suspicion, get your serology on, and treat these people. And take this care and try a course of doxycycline, if at all possible, watching out for Jarrett's Herxheimer reaction. To prevent it, just don't bathe in so much animal urine, and things will be better. What questions? So, who's treated leptoma? What questions have you gotten? No, I have a question. Did yeah. that um, did that man was that considered a um, job risk, or what did they? You know what I'm saying? Did he, did he get L and I coverage for what he for his intensive <laughs> no, care, which is a million bucks? No, it is. It's a big deal. Bathing in rat pee. Yeah. Wait. So he was taken care of by a colleague of mine, not by me. And I asked him about this. Had the patient ever heard of leptospirosis? Was he ever counseled on this? He just laughed. He said, you've got to be kidding. No one talks about this. It's not even on their radar screen. And yet, come. So I don't understand how it is that the sanitation industry doesn't talk with these guys about it. The truth is, if they're wearing proper gloves, which they should be anyway, not for this, but for tetanus and staph and whatever else, then this problem should be dramatically reduced. And I think he probably was barehanded and hadn't cut some cracks in his hands because he works for a living, and he got inoculated that way. No, he'd never heard of this before, and I don't know what his insurance situation is. But it is a hazardous situation. Sorry, did he go did back? He oh, no. he had to. I mean, I'm, I don't know that for a fact. I'm sure he went back to work. No, he was from Latin America. He worked for a living. This guy was the real deal. He had a sports family. I'm sure he went back. Although he had a long convalescence, I think. Yes. Mostly, yeah, so why do they get, good question, why do they get this hyperbilirubinemia? They don't all have stones. It looks like it's mostly a direct uh, problem. That's correct. So these patients can have a tender engorgement of the liver. A little bit of hepatomegaly is not unusual. And it sort of hurts, too, on palpation. They won't necessarily have a Murphy sign. It's not like a stone or something. But yeah, and I think I would think of it that way. It would with flu, et cetera. Remember, the liver, in addition to everything else it does, it's one of your biggest reticular endothelial organs. It's probably an immune response as much as anything else. But I don't know what it is about lepto that goes to the liver and does that. I'm not sure what's happening there. I don't know if anybody knows that. Good question. Is it for another one? 
let's see, it's now 3.40. What if we go to, can I go for another 10 minutes or so? Give you guys a break. And then we'll just, and then all I have is cases, okay? So here's a case. Here's a 45-year-old man who has bloody diarrhea after coming up from Costa Rica. I wanted to give you a little travel medicine. Remember, travel medicine is totally not the same as tropical medicine. Not. There's some overlap, but they're not the same. So let's do a little travel mess for the difference. So what was the history? He spent a week in San Jose. In business. He's in manufacturing. He dined with clients at restaurants and at their homes. He was their guest. He stayed in the high-rise hotel. Never went out of town. Didn't pay for sex or have casual sex while he was there. His stools turned runny on the third day. And he had Imodium. He used it. And it worked great for two days, and then it wasn't doing anything anymore. And now he has a foul-smelling gelatinous brown stool with some bright red blood on the toilet paper. He has pretty severe uh, belly cramps when he moves his bowels, otherwise not so much. And some subjective fevers. He has a white chromosome, therefore he has no thermometer, right? Those two are not compatible. <laughs> so he has no untreated hypertension. He has high lipids. He's an American businessman. He took all his vaccines when he was a kid. He's on Imodium and acetaminophen. He's got a 20-pack year history, no family history. He has fever, tachycardia, there's his blood pressure. He weighs 196 pounds, and he's tired. And on exam, the only thing that you're finding on exam is, in fact, the belly. Hyperactive bowel sounds, diffusely firm to palpation everywhere. Voluntary guarding is how I would describe it. Uh, no hepatosplenomegaly. He has external hemorrhoids that are engorged, a little bit of tenderness, and some maroon blood on your gloved finger. So what do you want for this job? You're here at CU, you're in a primary care clinic, a walk-in. Doc in the box clinic. CBC. CBC is a good start. I love it. Anything else? Put one on ice. I'm oh, sorry? Put one, one on ice. Excellent. <laughs> I like that a lot. What else? We do? It is a fever coming back from tropics. Anything else? Blood smears. Blood smears. The cheapest, easiest, bestest thing to do. Love it. Love it. <laughs> Here's your CBC. White count's 12,000. The diff is fine. The script's okay. Splatements are okay. You've got the first film. That's fast. Negative so far. Everything else is pending. You also got a comprehensive metabolic panel because you weren't worried about his liver or his kidneys. The internal medicine docs were infatuated with the creatinine. What's the creatinine? So we decided to sit that. Everything else is cooking. So if you're calling me with this case by telephone, you would describe it as dysentery, meaning inflammatory. Bloody diarrhea out of urban Latin America, who is mildly toxic, seems to be an immunonormal host. So, if my fellow calls me at night with this, I would say, Okay, what is your differential diagnosis? What do you think? Chagas. I'm sorry? Chagas? Could it be Chagas disease? He's coming out of Latin America, he's got a fever. Holy crap, what if it's Chagas? I love it. Turns out there's very little Chagas in Costa Rica and none that I know of in San Jose. Good question. If you don't think Chagas, you won't make the diagnosis. Shigella, Salmonella, E. coli. Campylobacter, love it. So you're thinking about so called, what we used to call bacillary dysentery, right? So could this be a gram negative rod driving this? Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Those are the things that are on my list too. Uh, I would include Etamiba histolytica, so something called amebiasis. It can present very much this way as well. Um, that's on the list as well. And look, uh, maybe he's got the first episode of Crohn's disease of his life, right? I mean, there's other stuff that this could be, but common things being common, yeah. Now, what about malaria? Why don't you send that blood bill? Who sent the blood bill? That's crazy talk. Can you get diarrhea from malaria? Yes. 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 Yes, God, yes, yes, extremely common to get diarrhea from malaria. Not dysentery. I've never seen bloody diarrhea. But boy, malaria and diarrhea go hand in hand. That is absolutely not in the textbooks. No one talks about this super duper common. And, 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 one of the other paradigms of tropical medicine is where there's one infection, there's going to be another. He could easily have more than one thing. So we always exclude malaria, please, in these pictures coming out of the tropics. Paper from Annals of Internal Medicine, 2006, every fatal case of imported malaria in the United States among travelers was analyzed, root cause analysis, for every one of the 163 cases since 1963. And in every one of the cases, this was, the doctors missed it, basically. We screwed up. We either didn't give prophylaxis, the patient didn't take it, or we didn't think about malaria when they came. I'm not the malaria guy this course, but for God's sakes, don't let anybody die of malaria. Good. Okay, so 
the germ docs like me were terrible, right? Because we give you all these lists around all the different things. Is it Campylobacter? Is it Shigella? So we'll break it down by small bowel or big bowel. Is it bacterial, viral, or parasitic? And you've got these lists. And it's like, how do I, the guy just has brown stool. How do I fix this? And how do you figure out what the guy's got? And the good news is that in most cases, of course, it absolutely positively does not matter. Diarrhea will get better almost always. But in dysentery, I do want to try to figure this out. So having said so, you don't know which of the things on that list. Everything you said and many more is up here. So you're, you've got a CBC that's going, comprehensive panel that's cooking. What are you going to do for this poor guy? What other testing might you want in the clinic? Yeah, ooh, that's great because he's really got to go. In fact, where's the bathroom? Oh, it's too late. <laughs> yeah, so he's going to give you a stool right on the spot. <laughs> so you got to look at the stool, right? Check the poop. Check the poop. There is, um, one of my wife's favorite, favorite TV shows is called Scrubs. And they have a musical number called Check the Poop. Yes. And uh, yeah, just Google it. You guys can YouTube it at the break. It's pretty funny. Is he, so, is he C. diffy? Generally speaking, no, C. diff. I love this idea. What about C. diff? Community acquired C. diff, really smart idea. In fact, it would be so interesting if he had taken some antibiotics, maybe doxycycline for malaria prophylaxis. I think that community acquired C. diff is something we don't think about often enough. I would send this guy a stool for C. diff. I like that idea a lot. I think the question in diarrhea is you have this stool, when should you bother testing anything for it, right? So here's an interesting paper that came out of, um, oh, one of those southern states, Louisiana, Kentucky, one of those. It was great, Tennessee, I think. So I think it was Tennessee, where they said, look, we really want to know what people's diarrhea is caused by. And so when they got wind, it's a bad term to use, when they learned <laughs> the diarrheal outbreak, they would actually, they did case finding, and they actually checked the poop of everyone involved in those outbreaks. And they did this, they had a grant to do it, I think from CDC. It's interesting. And so this is what they would send if you had gone to the church picnic where somebody else got sick, they sent you this cup and with this instruction sheet that shows you how to collect the poop and send it back. And then they tested it for everything to see what they could find. And this is the results. So uh, it was 54 outbreaks, and within the outbreaks, well uh, more than, I think, 300 people involved. So a lot of poop. And what they found was, number one, hell, a huge amount of norovirus. So lots and lots of noro, no surprise. And you didn't have to go on a cruise ship to catch this incredibly common cause of community-acquired diarrhea, coast to coast. And then a handful of other stuff. And they even looked for preformed endotoxin with staph and clostridium, very detailed, elegant analysis. So number one, a lot of norovirus. Number two, very little gram-negative rods. Number three, a third of the time they couldn't tell. They had no idea what it was. The stool testing was negative. So with that in mind, do we still want to test this guy's stool? Oh, and the other thing I want to say is, let's look at an even bigger sample number. So here's a nice paper uh, from CID where they looked at essentially not a meta-analysis, but they just reported as a conglomerate a whole bunch of studies looking at poop. Heroic amounts of poop. 217,000 <laughs> stools were tested in this one particular <laughs> test, looking for ova and parasites and looking for other testing as well. So what came out of this, the bottom line was, if you check close to a million human American stools, what do you get? Well, the first thing to say is, number one, ova and parasites extremely unlikely to be positive. Between two and three percent of the time, if you check an ONP in America, you're gonna get something that's abnormal. Usually Giardia lamblia. Otherwise, extremely unlikely. We don't have a lot of GI pathogens as parasites in this country. And number two, if there's any one test you're going to send, oh, man, oh, mighty. This is the percent of these patients that had a positive one out of five times. If you said a C. diff test, it was positive. And this is going back to the 1990s. That's not today in the middle of our huge outbreak where we've completely screwed ourselves with antibiotics. So I'm not saying not to send an open parasite. I'm just saying 97% of the time it'll be good to be wrong. But it's unlikely to be right.